main part of my research, which is mainly around antimicrobial resistance. And then I'm going to talk about how Galaxy fits into what I'm trying to do in the three areas that are my main focus. So first thing, I'm an end user. Okay, I've been doing this for a really long time. Um, so I've been doing proteomics properly for about 15 years, um, started out doing lots and lots of 2D gels, um, then had to teach myself how to use Nanoflow mass spectrometry. Um, you can see in the top photo there, the two old Q-Star elites that I have that have now unfortunately, uh, unfortunately been retired um, and have gone to God. Um, my main focus over the years has more been about actually how to get the maximum amount of proteins out of things to be able to analyze. And our core facility is a little bit unique in that we don't do a lot of work on human stuff. We don't do a lot of plasma, although we are starting to do more. We tend to do a lot of microorganisms and a lot of non-model organisms. Um, so recently in the last two or three years, the focus of my research and the focus of the core facility has been moving not away from proteomics, but it has been adding to it, um, especially lipidomics, which I've been doing for some projects with the blood service. Um, and also is slowly moving in, into uh, metabolomics. So I'll be upfront, I don't know how to code, okay? I have no idea, okay? I understand the logic behind it, but I don't really do it. A lot of the work that I've done over time has more been into uh, trying to improve sample extraction and trying to improve the normalization of doing the analytical methods before you get to the instrument. Um, and in my view, that's to try and minimize the need to do uh, post acquisition normalization or any kind of manipulation. And we did publish a review on this and, and a few opinions about this a few years ago. Historically, because of the lack of um, bioinformatics expertise that we have, um, we've had a reliance on proprietary and GUI based software. So we've been using Peak Studio for about 14 years. Um, we know our way around Progenesis. Uh, we used to use Mascot, not so much anymore. Um, and we are um, users of Skyline. Now, the reason for this is that the majority of people who come through the core facility, not necessarily my immediate research students, um, the majority of research students in uh, my experience, see proteomics as a tool rather than an overwhelming, immersing vocation that a lot of us uh, who do proteomics and the other omics, we tend to get obsessed with the process rather than necessarily what we can use it for. So a lot of the students who come through, all they want to do is to learn enough to get their data, to answer their question, and then go off and do whatever the next biological experiment is. And so we can't really waste a lot of time and effort in those people trying to encourage them to get into programming and coding and things like that if it's not in the interest of them completing their projects. Um, so in that case, the simplest solution is just to unleash them on proprietary software. Um, the other part of the other huge part of my job is that I actually run a master's degree, a postgraduate master's degree in medical biotech. And one of the subjects that we do in that is actually proteomics. And so we've got this need to be able to take students who have got absolutely no background in, prote in proteomics and only teach them the basics. I'll come back to this a little bit later as well, but you've only got them for about 12 weeks. So the idea that we take in this case is that the pipeline itself doesn't really fundamentally change. It's just the specifics of those steps. And so you can break a lot of the omics down to the extraction of biomolecules, quantify those abundance changes, and then interpret them in biology. But, but there's multiple different ways that you can get that. And I've listed a whole lot of these down at the bottom. So we, we give them the idea, you know, what's the, what's the difference between using gels or using chromatography? Why would you use data independent rather than data dependent? Which one of these search engines would be the most appropriate? Which stats package? So on and so forth. 
Um, and so that's the, the problem that we have with those teaching. We can't really get them to the level of immersion that a lot of people in this audience would be. And then lastly, I touched on this a little bit, the challenges of the core facility. Um, and because um, in, in Australia, um, there is certainly a lack of uh, funding from the government and things like that, especially for um, what they consider to be the basic research infrastructure. I mean, nowadays, um, the funding agencies consider that, that mass spectrometry should be provided for by the institution rather than the national government. And so the universities then have to find the funding to be able to put these things in place. Now, funding has been tight. It's been tight for a really long time. Um, you know, a lot of core facilities in Australia don't necessarily cover their costs. We certainly don't. Um, and so because of that lack of funding, we have started to move to a more reliance on open source and, and free solutions. So we've explored a lot of these in the past. And in addition to this, because of the lack of bioinformatics support that we get, we tend to stray towards Windows-based solutions that we can quite easily install on a desktop and off we go. We, we do have um, a high performance computing infrastructure, but it is difficult to access and the people who support that are not proteomics people. So trying to um, communicate to them what you are actually trying to do can be very challenging. And to a point, we just give up. Um, it's faster for us to try and figure this out, for, to stumble around in the dark and figure this out for ourselves. Which brings me to the, the point that I made before. I'm too old and I don't have the time to learn how to program. I'd, I'd rather be spending my time doing what's down in the bottom corner of the slide, to be perfectly honest. Um, a lot of our undergraduate courses, and we are undergoing um, some changes into our courses at the moment, we're doing course reviews, but the majority of um, undergraduate courses in uh, biology especially, don't do coding subjects. They don't introduce this. There is some uh, courses provided by other parts of the university, e-research, for instance, about how to use R and, and things such as that, but they're not really tailored to a few thousand undergraduate students. And because we don't teach them that in undergrad, we don't really have the time to teach them how to do it in postgrad. Um, it would take up the majority of my particular subject to do that. So what a number of us see um, especially those of us who run the core facility, is that all of these problems that I've listed, Galaxy is one of the solutions to try and overcome a number of these issues that I've probably very poorly pointed out. So I'm going to move on from that and just completely switch around and start talking a little bit more of the interesting stuff that we do as a, as a prelude to trying to bring everything back together. So I've been interested for a few years, um, yeah, probably 10 or 12 years in the mechanisms of antibiotic resistance. I've been doing a lot of work with, we have um, an institute, uh, Infection Immunity and Innovation, which is mainly uh, populated with people who work on some really, really nasty pathogens and trying to figure out host pathogen interactions. But probably a year or so ago, um, I started to come back to this whole idea of antibiotic resistance. And you can see in the slide on the, uh, the right-hand side, these are the basic mechanisms that, the, that uh, resistant organisms use to overcome um, the insult of antibiotics. Now, most of the antibiotics listed on this slide, there is some strain of bacteria that has shown resistance. So we're starting to run out of things to treat these things with. Um, and the experience that we've all had with COVID is going to start becoming the norm because the predictions are by 2050, more people are going to die from any antimicrobial resistant bacteria than any other human disease. So it's something that we've got to address. So 
one of the things that has um, emerged recently is this idea of predicting bacterial resistance and it this leverages off next generation sequencing so previously the, the way that you would normally do this in a microbiology laboratory is that you would culture these isolates you would take clinical samples you would culture them on loads of different types of media to select for different types of organisms and then you would test with antibiotics to look at these susceptibilities that's a long and laborious process. It can take days. And by the time you've worked out that a particular antibiotic has been affected, the patient has already deteriorated a long way. And so what clinicians do is um, they basically give the patient everything um, to hope that something works. But the issue with that is that you start to select for antibiotic resistance. So one of the things that has become an idea, and um, this is a lot of this work is being done by uh, a group in at the university and um, it, at the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries called Ausgem, where they have this idea of doing what's called genomic surveillance, and they use next generation sequencing to completely sequence the bacterial genome and any plasmids that are in there, and then use bioinformatics to then predict what these genes are going to be, what proteins that they're going to produce. Now, that then led me to the question that just because a gene is present, does it actually therefore mean that that particular strain is going to be resistant to a particular antibiotic? And it, that, that may sound like an odd question, but it comes back to the idea, does genotype actually predict phenotype? Um, and I think that any of us who have been doing proteomics or the omics for long enough realize that that is actually not completely correct. Um, that genotype does not necessarily um, infer phenotype. There's also this other piece of dogma that the, it's these plasmids and these mobile genetic elements, which uh, one of which is shown down in the bottom here. Um, these are the things that actually spread resistance. And to a point that is actually true, but with the presence of that, when a bacteria takes up these resistance elements, it can integrate them into its chromosome. Um, that makes it not necessarily more difficult to pass on, but it makes it more persistent. But having these plasmids and having these resistant elements, how does that then affect the chromosome of the bacteria and does the chromosome then reinforce the resistance by producing other proteins? So these are the kind of fairly basic questions that we want to ask. And you start going through the literature, people have kind of really overlooked this. So my one of my students in my technical office is Stephanie. Um, she started to do this um, a year or so ago um, using just basic everyday naive E. coli K12, which you can actually buy in a bottle from Sigma. Um, it's got, it, it's allegedly susceptible to antibiotics. And we also, and then we started looking at a resistant strain out of a clinical collection that we've got. And what we find is when we do these things, the naive bacteria is still resistant to low doses of antibiotics. So in this case, we've treated with about 25 micrograms per mil worth of ampicillin, and these things survive. They survive quite happily, but their proteome does not change a lot. There is already mechanisms that are being produced that confer resistance. This is shown to a much greater degree when you have these resistant plasmids in there, and when you treat them with four times the amount of antibiotic, you get this kind of effect that's in the right side Venn diagram and in the, in the right side heat map, where you start to get an enormous amount of things that are changing in abundance. But the interesting thing that I haven't shown you here is that, um, and I forgot to put it on the slide, there is actually a whole lot of these resistance elements that are already expressed without the antibiotic being present. So these things are actually already almost primed for their environment to resist the onslaught before it even comes. Now, 
um, th this is a more graphical example of the way that this can work, where this is one of my research students who's been looking at Pseudomonas. And at the moment, all we've done is done the growth curves with the various amounts of antibiotics. So these are fairly easy to look at where the concentration of antibiotics actually increases as you go down those lines. And so you can see, you know, with gentamicin, you get the typical, you know, flattening out of the growth curve, but they don't actually stop. They do still keep reproducing. They're just doing it slowly. When we switch to a different class of antibiotic, um, in this particular case, because we went out to a fairly long time frame, we see these bacteria, we see at really high doses that you think that these things are dead, but eventually they start to recover. And so this is where I'm starting to get interested in these things because the reason that when you take antibiotics is that you're supposed to do the full full length course is to try and avoid this situation. But I start to wonder, even if you do take the full course, do you still end up in this situation where there are some in there that are able to survive those even very high doses of bacteria, although you get up to the really high doses and it is, it is killing them, um, that they do actually recover. And so what I wanna to start to do is look at the proteome and the metabolome changes that are happening in here. It could just be as simple as measuring the amount of antibiotic that's left. It could be that it's being processed by these bacteria at these high doses very, very slowly into something that doesn't affect them anymore. And then eventually the, there's so little there that they can start to recover. But these are things that the mechanisms are, are not really well looked at from a proteome and from a metabolomics point of view. So how does this actually fit in with Galaxy? Well. What we want to do with these organisms is basically everything that's put on the slide where all of this data goes into the middle to try and figure out the total picture of the biology of the organism in response to the antibiotics. And so this is, this is not a new idea. I mean, the majority of people who work in the omics space, th this would be their ideal where they take all of the different facets and put them all together. Um, and so what, what we have is we have for each one of these strains of bacteria, we have completely sequenced genomes. We have the open reading frame predictions. And this has been done by my collaborator, uh, Piklu, who's been doing this for numerous years. Um, and so what we're about to start to do on the Pseudomonas, which we've done a little bit with the E. coli, but not enough, um, is to just do basic shotgun MS. Um, and see what open reading frames are actually changing with these bacterial insults and what does happen over time. How does the proteome change temporarily? We're not interested in just looking at one time point. We're looking at trying to look at a temporal, um, uh, a temporal look at the proteome changes over time. Now, you'll notice that I said products of open reading frames because really that's all shotgun MS is actually measuring. It's, it's not measuring the changes in intact proteoforms. If you're lucky enough to get the peptide that defines a particular proteoform, then yes, you can, you can get that information. But in this particular case, we're just looking for changes in open reading frames. This is the start of the process in our mind. And Within Galaxy, there's a number of um, packages that allow us to be able to look at this information, MaxQuant, for instance. But a lot of our work is starting to move to the data independent acquisition because we find, as a lot of people have found, that the quantitation becomes a lot more robust. And so within Galaxy, um, there is Encyclopedia, um, which I've had a little bit of um, experience with, but just using the, the desktop Java version. I haven't tried to use it on Galaxy yet. Um, but then OpenSwath is available. I, I need to, to look and see um, whether the data that gets generated by, especially the new instrument we've got, which is a waters instrument, rather than the traditional thermo and um, uh, thermo and SciX instruments that a lot of uh, software is written around. Um, so it would be interesting to see whether or not I can use that data 
not necessarily an encyclopedia, but in things like Open Swath, um, which is on Galaxy, and Diane, which I don't believe at the moment is on Galaxy. I had a quick look earlier and I don't think that I could see it, but it's a, a piece of software that one of my, uh, that um, a postdoc who has just started with us has a lot of experience with. So we're, we're going to have a look at that. Um, eventually we'll come around to the bottom of the slide where we're going to have to go back and start looking at proteoforms again, which means that we go back to doing 2D gels, um, which grossly underestimate the, uh, the, pro the, uh, the proteome. The quantitation's fine, but rather than getting, you know, a thousand or 2000 uh, proteins out of a typical bacteria. So E. coli is about 4,600 open reading frames. Pseudomonas is about 6,000. Normally on a gel on a good day, you could probably get about a thousand spots. So you're only getting a quarter of the proteome, um, which is really not enough. So we need to work out fractionation ways to get to the rest of that. But we're also going to start exploring the idea of doing middle, more middle down stuff with longer and longer peptides um, to be able to try and get that uh, proteoform information from those larger peptides um, because they should have the sequence variations um, and potentially the post-translational modifications that we might be missing just by using trypsin. Um, that's work in progress. We haven't really started on that yet. The metabolo, uh, the lipidomic side, we've got a pretty good handle on. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll put the proprietary software in there because we've been lucky enough to score a license for Progenesis with the new instrument that we did buy. Um, we do, but I still do want to look into more workflows within Galaxy to be able to process that data. I mean. I like the idea of the open source community. I like the idea of building these things for the wider community so that people are not reliant on um, proprietary software because they didn't have the money to get it when they bought the instrument or they're working in an environment where they're sending stuff to a core facility and the core facility is just sending stuff back to them without really interpreting it. The metabolomics seems to be a little bit simpler. I mean, XCMS is, is well implemented on, on Galaxy and I have tried to use that before um, on the, the scripts version. Um, I need to get back to it. I need to generate more data to be able to give that much more of a crack. And then the other big piece of the puzzle that's missing in this is how are these proteins interacting? Do we get differences in protein? We will get differences in protein interactions when we treat these things with antibiotics, but what are they? And certainly we can use these inference-based methods where you've got things like string and reactome and so on and so forth. I have started to try and wrap my brain around Cytoscape um, to try and more streamline this because Cytoscape is able to pull in all of those different databases and hopefully give better inferences. The problem with that is, is if you're working in human or mice, the inferences are usually pretty good. Or if you're working in yeast, they're pretty good. Um, in bacteria, they're not so great. Um, they are getting better, but they're not brilliant. And then we want to then um, put on top of this um, the interactomics data from real experiments where we start to do co-fractionation using size exclusion chromatography, do that whole idea of guilt by association that particular proteins all occur in the same fraction. Therefore, it is most likely that they're going to occur in the same complex. Um, the same with doing crosslink uh, cross MS. I don't believe that either of these um, workflows are implemented in Galaxy. And to be perfectly honest, they are still in their infancy. The, the false discovery rates are still a little bit too high for my liking. Um, but there, there, there is some ways around that. But the problem is the ways around that is just creating more samples to analyze. Um, so that's basically all I wanted to talk about on research. Um, these things are a little bit related to research as well. But I just wanted to talk about more about how Galaxy now it, um, infers the way that we have to teach. Um, because in the postgraduate space that we have, we've been 
um, teaching online, um, a blended learning approach for a long time before COVID, three or four years. But COVID just forced a lot of us to move all of our content completely online. Um, so the way that we do these things is that we have pre-work that we get students to do. They go off and do that. They come back into workshops. They do a whole lot of other stuff to reinforce that learning. Um, and then we get them to do stuff after the fact to reinforce it yet again. They go into block mode prac classes. They generate a whole lot of samples that then go through the mass spectrometers and other things, and they end up with their own data. Now, previously, I would then take that data. I would put it through Peak Studio um, because we've only got one licensed version. Hand them the data. Uh, hand them the file, and they can look at it, you know, on a viewer. Which I think is the way that most people who access core facilities would be looking at data. By being able to use Galaxy where we can just hand them over, there's the, the raw data files. Here, here's the list of mascot tutorials, um, like the one that Melanie and Matthias have written, where we can unleash them on that and say, right, here's your pre-work. Go through that. Learn how you to get your way around that. And then in the workshop, we're going to talk about this some more. We're going to go through it and we're going to start putting your data into it. And so I would organize with the guys at Galaxy Australia to get a, a space to be able to do all of this stuff over, over a couple of weeks and let the students screw it up, learn from that experience, do it again, potentially screw it up again, but go through that process until they work out, okay, this is why things work and this is why things don't. The other really great advantage of using that is because they're on servers and we can access them over the internet, we, we don't need our information technology people to go into a computer lab and install it on 50 PCs. And especially at the moment, um, surprisingly, I still have a lot of students that are based in Southeast Asia who are remoting in to do um, our courses. And so it's important for them, they need to be able to do things on their own computers. Yes, we could ask them to install MaxQuant on their own PC, but processing is going to take forever. Um, it's much better for them to be able to access a platform like this to speed the process up. Um, yeah. Within the core facility space, it's, so, it's similar but different because there is a lot more interaction between the researchers and the core facility staff. And it basically goes around and around in this kind of wheel where we get people in, we plan their experiments, we provide them with the methodologies that we've developed for sample prep and normalization and things like that. The, we, we, we help them out with standardized instrument acquisition and things like that. We, we tweak it if we need to. They go off and they perform the experiments with our guidance. We generate data. We then discuss the analysis with them. And in this case, what we've started to do is actually say to these people, go and look at this. Go and look at this. Try all of this out before you come and talk to us so that you've got some background understanding so that we can have a better conversation about what's going on. And it becomes much, much more productive in the way that we can interact um, and provide you with information and ideas. They do that, they analyze their own data, they come back to us and they discuss, you know, does it look good? Does it look bad? Should I use it? You know, do I need to do it again? Or, you know, is it fine? And then if it's not fine, we go back into the circle again. So I've just listed on the side there, the kind of things, the tutorials that we're actually encouraging um, both postgraduate students and research students to look through to start to understand how to analyze these particular pieces of data. The ones that we're moving into as well, um, we do have a few people who are, and, and especially with the antimicrobial stuff, we are interested in proteogenomics. We are interested in trying to find proteins that are not bioinformatically predicted because we know that these things exist. Um, and also, surprisingly, someone from the engineering faculty came and started to talk to me about doing uh, metaproteomics on some wastewater samples um, that he had. Um, I, I don't quite know what, where these things had come from, 
but um, he wants to know the collection of microorganisms that are in this stuff. And I'm like, okay, that sounds like a bit of fun, but I haven't heard from, in a, heard from him in a while. Then the bottom bit is just looking at the tutorials that are there now, the things that, it'd be, that it would be nice to have, because a lot of the tutorials that are there are, I mean, there are some that are um, fairly generic, which is, you know, how should you do your experiment? How does proteomics work and so on and so forth. But an, another few, like the difference between DDA and DIA and why would you use them? And why is one better than the other? That'd be kind of, that'd be very, very useful. There, I know that there are um, some DIA pipelines in the works. Um, possibly one um, could be written for Encyclopedia. Um, uh, I did because, um, and I have mentioned this to Brian Searle that um, the, uh, the directions that he gives in one of the MCP papers is not as clear as it could be. Um, and I think he got distracted by his latest thing and didn't go back and fix it, but uh, it probably needs to be done. And then the last one was, the, was what I was talking about before is um, what is there and what can we string together to do pathway analysis and things like that and actually instruct a person, you know, you, here's, here's your list of things that are changing in abundance. What do you do now? Um, so those are, the, those are the, just the kind of things just off the top of my head, mainly this afternoon that I was thinking of. Um, and that's pretty much all I really wanted to talk about. I mean, I know it's a little bit superficial, but um, I wasn't sure how much to talk about and how much not to talk about. Um, the people who contributed are, are on there. Um, and also, I you know thank the people who I support who get... Uh, give us support in Australia, the Galaxy people from Australia, um, based in Queensland and based in Melbourne, Australian Biocommons, who actually provide the funding for all of this infrastructure, and um, Ausgem, who uh, help us out with the strain collections and doing the, uh, the genomic sequencing, which gives us the databases to start searching this stuff against. And um, yeah, I'm pretty much done. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Matt. Uh, lots to um, go through and lots to um, maybe even uh, comment on. But I just wanted to kind of mention on your last slide, for pathway analysis, the Protea RE group has quite a few uh, resources available. Um, I think they, okay. and, yeah, I'm not sure whether they're available on Galaxy EU, but they have a website and I can share the information with you. Where you Please. can try, um, I can you can try that. Uh, in terms of Encyclopedia DI, we are in process of making a GTN, um, you know, on that. So um, you'll soon, you know, hear something about it. Maybe by summer, you'll have a GTN ready for that. Um, I'll let others ask any questions. I know we are, um, we have another speaker coming after this. But are there any questions, or if you want to put them in chat, uh, maybe Matt can also uh, answer them through chat. Are there yeah, any that's questions? Fine. Any questions for Matt? No, nope. I've confused everyone. <laughs> no, I mean, there are quite a few interesting aspects to it. And I think I should, I'll definitely follow up with you. Uh, you know, the the thing about unknown ORFs or, you know, uh, you know, I, I had a question about antimicrobial, re antimicrobial resistance. And uh, have you looked into you know, the proteins that are expressed in the antimicrobial resistance strains, um, have you found any of these which have not been, which, you know, proteins that are expressed like hypothetical proteins or proteins that have not been assigned any functions? Do, have you seen any of them getting uh, uh, expressed? Off the top of my head, I, I think we have. Mm -hmm. I think we have. I would just have to go back and look through the list and see what they were. Um, and I couldn't, there's not a lot. I mean, especially in, in E. coli, I mean, of, of all of the bacteria that are, um, th that are known, coli is probably the best characterized. Mm -hmm. And so the vast majority of proteins do have an assigned, some kind of assigned function to them. Um, I, I'd have to go back and look and see what kind of ones were uncharacterized or hypotheticals. But I guess the, the other side of that idea is, and something that we did a lot of work on in mycoplasma, um, is th the, this idea of multifunctional proteins where um, you've got a protein that is um, caniacally annotated as having function X. And 
um, elongation factor TU is actually a really good example of this where um, it it's, has an annotated function in DNA replication, but it's also um, susceptible to being processed. And those processing products then have other functionalities, like they bind other proteins, they bind fibronectin, they bind actin, they, they, they assist in host invasion and things like that. And a lot of that stuff is not actually annotated um, in, in the databases. And so, you, yeah, when you do these analyses, um, the databases are only as good as the information that's put in them. It's mm -hmm. only as good as what's been reported. Um, and so there is a lot of things that we look at and we're sort of like, okay, caniacally from the description, I didn't expect to see that there. Mm -hmm. What is it doing? Is it a binding partner of something else? Is it now exhibiting some kind of functionality because it's been, pro it's been proteolytically processed into another form that now has a different activity. So those are the kind of things we're looking for as well. Yeah. Uh, and I also like the, the fact that you've been using the Galaxy Training Network tutorials and plan to use them, you know, in your, uh, you know, in, in kind of educating new researchers into this. Um, some of the points that you mentioned in terms of, you know, what would be nice to have, you definitely take note of that. Um, but yeah, I think uh, thanks very much uh, for you know coming late uh, or early early in the morning and giving a talk. Um, I'll kind of now switch over to uh, a talk on um, a tool uh, or tools that have been developed um, by uh, the group at uh, University of uh, Bergen in Norway. So um, I'll just introduce Carlos Horo Marcos. Um, Carlos Horo Marcos is a chief engineer at the CBU, which is University of Bergen in Norway. Um, and he is working in Harold uh, Basner's group on uh, tasks related to mass spectrometry analysis, improving tools such as uh, search GUI and peptide shaker. And we use search GUI and peptide shaker um, a lot in our workflows. And recently they have uh, updated this. So I'll uh, basically let um, Carlos talk about uh, the work that he has done and updates to these tools. Thank you. I will share my screen. Yeah. As you said, uh, well, I work with Harald Barnes at the Proteomics Unit at ROA, Department of Medical Medicine at the UIB, and also at the Computational Biology Unit, the Department of Informatics. Uh, I have to mention that my background is uh, mainly as a computer engineer uh, during 15, 15 years. Uh, also, my experience in proteomics is far more shorter, <laughs> about the last uh, four years or so. So I guess almost all of you have more experience than me <laughs> on the field. Um, so I will introduce the tools. Uh, well, uh, given that our workflow uh, for identifying peptide and proteins uh, is uh, this one. Um, Sersky and peptide shaker uh, are like the uh, last steps of it. Sersky uh, uh, is the uh, responsible of searching the pick list against a sequence database using one or more search engines. Uh, and returning uh, peptide match uh, by uh, choosing a search engine for its spectrum, uh, PSMs. Um, peptide Shaker would be the responsible of identifying the peptides and infer and validate uh, the proteins and peptides by uh, search key. Uh, just to mention that, of course, our tools uh, depend also on the previous steps, uh, the conversion from raw uh, files to NZML or to MDF. Uh, NZML is quite recently supported. And those conversions have been tested mainly uh, what, uh, NS Convert in Windows, or of course in Linux, Mac, and Galaxy. Uh, for thermo Fisher raw files, we have usually used uh, raw tools and the thermal raw file parts, which has been recently integrated. Well, having uh, the previous steps in mind, um, 
the definition of search key would be uh, like an interface for configuring and running this prototype search and the Novo engines. We currently support Xtandem, Mirimatch, NSmanda, NSGF Plus, OMSA, Comet, Time, Andromeda, Metamorphosis, and also uh, Novo and later Tag. Uh, also on the other side, PetaShaker uh, is a platform for interpretation of protomics identification results for multiple search and de novo engines. Well, uh, I guess uh, my talk uh, is due to the uh, recent uh, refurbishment of all our tools. It uh, started uh, back on 2017 when we had Sersky branch three and Pestai Shaker branch one. And they both require a uh, deep cleaning uh, organization. We had a uh, very old code there, uh, a lot of compatibility code too. Um, and uh, while we were using Derby database and that was giving us uh, many problems related to performance, multi-threading issues, and also it had many uh, issues trying to serialize uh, big data sets. So summarizing that we have maintenance, performance, and serialization problems at that time. Due to these problems, we started a huge refactoring for three years, but that were in the back ends. Um, those, well, this development was mainly done by uh, Harald Badnes and uh, also by, by Mark Baudel and Dominic Kopczynski. I just uh, uh, did some minor contributions. Um, our first option, option as a database it was Zoom database, um, but I guess it had, well, it was uh, pretty new at that time and it was no very for ISET. Um, so we had many problems related to object structure and inheritance and so on. Um, yeah, by the end, we had to abandon this adoption. And it, we uh, chose uh, instead uh, SQ Lite, which had a pretty better performance and didn't have any uh, multi threading management. That is well, that has been the final option chosen by the new branches. Well, uh, the greatest change in the for the new backends uh, has been, as I said, uh, uh, improved performance and multi uh, also a better uh, multi-threading management. We have changed the format of uh, uh, the projects from the Derby database to SQL Lite uh, projects or database. So PestaiShaker is no longer compatible with the old CPSX format. That uh, brought us the opportunity to uh, clean a lot of code and also to return smaller uh, PestaiShaker project files. We have also support uh, Metamorpheus search engine. Um, we can import now uh, NSML and raw formats. We are also uh, able to include uh, user uh, customized enzymes uh, using the graphical interface or uh, via client, common client. And um, well, we can also uh, zip uh, search engine results uh, if the user chooses to do that. Finally, we have also uh, remove the FASTA file uh, URL uh, out of the parameters file, which I think uh, gives mm, well, a better opportunity to uh, reuse this uh, parameters file. Well, uh, related to uh, the Galaxy tools, uh, by the end, it also took mostly at the same time out three years, because in this case, uh, this was mainly done just by me. And uh, well, uh, I had a lot of feedback by uh, Björn Green and Matthias Bern, um, but uh, the development was interrupted many times due to these uh, issues related to the Zoom database. And also because I was on paternity leave for many months. Um, and also, I was uh, contributing to your Galaxy tools, 
uh, with some little small contribution to the thermal file uh, converter but i also uh, developed the pathway maker uh, wrapper and i fixed some stuff for more Well, um, also we try to uh, support the Galaxy tools uh, as much functionality as possible uh, for the uh, applications themselves. Uh, we were we are still missing some functionality, like we still miss Metamorpheus support and the uh, Galaxy wrappers. Um, we still don't support uh, custom enzymes and PTMs. Uh, defined via the Galaxy graphical user interface. And uh, in order to uh, separate concepts and uh, yeah, make all, all the different steps uh, uh, in the workflow uh, more clearer, uh, we have delegated the raw file conversion to the thermal raw file converter tool. Uh, our uh, improvements on to the uh, new backends, uh, Galaxy tools have been uh, the complete restru restructure of the parameters, adopting the way they are shown in the apps itself. Uh, the entire uh, code organization, multiple bug fixes, and of course, uh, we have improved a lot of the documentation in the Galaxy tools. Um, about the workflow, uh, there have been some changes. Uh, maybe now is uh, some steps uh, longer than it was, but uh, we think that it's clearer um, and now uh, it's more reusable uh, than it was before. Certainly, the uh, backend has been replaced or split into three different uh, Galaxy tools. Uh, the FASTA client, uh, which uh, just add the coins to, uh, to a FASTA file in the format that Sergi uh, is able to understand. Um, the identification parameter tool, which comprises all the uh, parameters that were mostly spread around uh, all Sergi and Pestaisaker Galaxy tools. And also the search git to uh, itself. Well, as I said, um, the old way, uh, the workflow may, might be just executing uh, search key um, with the results offered by it, uh, just giving them to Pestaisaker. Now, we at least need to have uh, parameters file uh, created by the identification parameters tool. And uh, if you don't have a FASTA file with the proper uh, decoys info, uh, you also uh, need to create uh, one with the FASTA client and give it to search. If you already have a proper FASTA file, it's not necessary to execute the FASTA client. As a quick overview of the main difference in the uh, graphical user interface, uh, we can see that in the new uh, version at the right, uh, we have this new identification parameters file as an input. Um, we also have moved uh, almost all options non search the related options, protein data resource and protein digestion option, precursor, and so on, uh, they have been moved to the identification parameter tool. Um, well, also we can see that OMSA is not executed by default anymore. This is due to uh, two reasons. Uh, in the first place, we think that is quite old right now. And in the second place, uh, now uh, also may fail uh, in minimal containers uh, due to uh, some compilation problems in Conda. We would uh, have to uh, reuse a Conda package uh, with the OMSA search engine. 
Um, that has not been done yet. Um, now we are including the binary um, that gives some uh, errors. If you don't have the proper compilation tools in your system, uh, that, that may fail. Um, so well, that only should happen in very minimal uh, installations. And I guess most of the cases it will still work. And with uh, Peptide Shaker, uh, as you can see, uh, well, the identification parameters also are, well, uh, sorry. Uh, here we can see that uh, new backend uh, can uh, get uh, search key results just from the new backend too. Uh, if you uh, try to reuse uh, search key results from different backend versions, uh, it will not be detected as the extension is different. Uh, also, well, uh, many options uh, have been uh, moved to the identification parameters tool. Well, talking about the future of uh, Sersky and PetaCycle Galaxy tools, uh, we still have some issues to manage. Uh, especially, we are having some memory related issues. Uh, we have some people uh, opening issues in our issue tracker, uh, talking about uh, memory problems when they deal with huge data sets or with low memory uh, configurations. Um, we still have to enable metamorphosis uh, that may require some time as it uh, requires .NET to work. Uh, it's, it's not able to work with Mono and .NET uh, Conda package is offered by Conda Forge. Um, it needs a glibc uh, version more modern than the one support by uh, by Oconda uh, compilation uh, engine. So when that happens, we will enable it in the Galaxy tool. Everything is already prepared for that. We have also uh, planned to create two new uh, Galaxy tools uh, just for uh, creating user-defined enzymes and for uh, custom uh, DTMs. Uh, in the long term, we will try to reuse more specific uh, Conda packages for every search engine in order to avoid uh, any compilation problem as we were having with OMSA. Uh, just for finalizing, I wanted to mention that we have been working also on a different usage of uh, Sersky and Petite Shaker uh, Galaxy tools. There is a new web application, uh, it will be called Petite Shaker Online, and we will be, well, will mostly comprise the functionality from Sersky and Petite Shaker. Uh, adding some uh, uh, quantification data uh, from MOF and uh, some protoforms related data uh, from Pathway Maker. So we are uh, using more tools, that, not just Sersky and Peptide Shaker and Galaxy tools. The functionality is mostly finished, and we are going to start with the uh, paper quite soon. This is like a screenshot of it. It's still a snapshot version, but as you can see, it's quite similar uh, to the uh, desktop application. Yeah. Uh, well, I've done. Um, I wanted to mention, well, all my team, both at the computational radiology unit and at the protomics department at the University of Bergen. And of course, uh, thank you very much to the Galaxy project uh, for the missing people there, to Galaxy Proteomics for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk here, and uh, giving special thanks to Björn Gurning and Matthias Van for their amazing feedback and helpful <laughs> no rest. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Thanks, Carlos. Um, are, are there any questions? I have a few questions, but I'll let others ask any questions if they have any about um, the new implementation of Search Queen Peptide Shaker. Try to reply. <laughs> As I say I'm not the main developer of uh, SARS-CoV-2 and Peptide Shaker, uh, but I will try to do my best. <laughs> sure. I had one question, maybe I'll start and then others can join in. I know we have been actually testing some of the new version of surgical and peptide shaker. So um, in your testing, have you uh, performed comparison of the old version of surgical peptide shaker with the new one and seen any changes in the identification? We have not done a specific uh, test of the results from them both. We are aware that there are differences Mm -hmm. um, of course, um, new backends now support more uh, PTNs. Um, search engines are newer than they were. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of bug fixes uh, uh, between both versions. So we are sure that there will be some differences. We think that for the better. Um, but uh, of course, the, we may be missing uh, some. Uh, uh, the, the, we are registering new issues in our issue tracker. Mm -hmm. So, so Matt had a question uh, asking, how is the identification parameters file generated? Yeah. Uh, well, the identification parameters file uh, is generated mostly in the same way than it was. But in the old backend, um, it was uh, the first step uh, done in the uh, Sersky Galaxy wrapper itself. And it was reused as an internal parameter in Sersky. Now that has been removed to a different uh, Galaxy tool. So um, yeah, in uh, this tool, you just uh, choose the option you uh, consider by default they are mostly the same than they were before uh, but it, you can decide if you customize some of them or not and a json uh, file uh, with a, a par extension is generated and this uh, par ex ex uh, extension is uh, detected uh, as a valid parameters file by search by the new backend. Uh, so it may be reduced automatically uh, uh, establishing a workflow. Uh, I, I know Melanie is here. Um, Me Melanie, uh, have you done tests on, I mean, we have used search queen peptide shaker in most of our workflows, uh, but haven't started using the new version, but you know, I don't know whether you or Matthias have um, had to change the new version and what was your experience on that? Yeah, we were very thankful um, if anyone can offer some feedback yeah, or any difference they may have to realize it especially they have for the worst. <laughs> sure sure no yeah, I, we have not yeah. yet Go we on. have not yet tested the new version um, okay. so I just know that we still have some all the tutorials about identification with search GUI and peptide shaker and that they need an update but i've not yet started doing anything okay yeah i mean we are in process of doing that as well i think what we'll do is going forward for newer data sets we will start using that but um as long as the earlier versions are still available we should be able to use it but we can kind of make a decision on that um uh, in terms of uh you know, you, you mentioned about thermo raw file parser, right? Um, does search GUI work only on MGML or MGF files that are, you know, that are converted from this or can it also take an MS convert generated MGF files or MGML files? Well, I haven't just recently um, uh, raw files from MS convert, but when I was doing the first test, uh, they worked perfectly with them. Mm -hmm. uh, we just had to test more deeply uh, the model of our parser because it, it's part of our standard workflow. Mm -hmm. um, also, when I was in the middle of the development of the new backend, 
Uh, our first plan uh, was to use raw tools. Mm -hmm. I contributed a bit to it too. Um, by the end, I think it was working too with the last version of Pro Tools. Okay. So all of them should work fine. If they don't, uh, it would be very thankful if someone kind of found out that. Yeah, I mean, we have been using MS Convert on Galaxy EU to convert our uh, raw files into uh, MGF files. We haven't tested the MCML yet. Um, but I was wondering whether it's necessary to use thermo raw file parser rather than or converter rather than um, MS convert. Um, and and the one one of the last files was uh, questions I had was I mean I'm kind of excited to know about the peptide shaker online uh, and also especially about this uh, tool called Pathway Matcher. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit about what Pathway Matcher does? Um. Well, uh, it has been two years since I was involved in it, uh, so I don't remember uh, so much right now. Um, it's, it's all right. We can wait for the paper to come out or... It's, yeah, I can show you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was wondering whether it kind of, it takes the identifications and then does some kind of a pathway matching. I mean, that's what it implies, but was mm -hmm. curious to know what it does so. but it's all going to be online and it's going to be kind of packaged into one tool is that what uh, it's like? yes. one interface i have a demo version online on our mm -hmm. server uh, i can show it to you if you are interested in it. Uh, sure yeah yeah we uh, can yeah. share my screen i think uh -huh. Mm -hmm. This is the main web page. Okay. Um, it is intended to support uh, custom data during login with your uh, API, uh, user API. Uh, now we have some uh, default uh, user. It will be used uh, when the uh, paper uh, is published uh, for the reviewing process. That's this example. Just I think. This is like the review version. As you can see, it works mm -hmm. quite similarly than Peptide Shaker. Mm -hmm. um, we have tried to make uh, the user experience uh, as good or even better than a uh, normal desktop application. Uh, okay. Uh, the, most interesting part is maybe the way you can um, interact mm -hmm. uh, because this is uh, actually a, a web browser application, but the, uh, well, you have to be able to interact with this stuff like if it's a normal desktop application. Um, well, it's able to generate uh, thousands of nodes and you can interact with them quite in a fast way. Um, uh, I think it will give uh, that is not working right now. Okay. It will make a difference. Um, okay. Yeah, there's a GitHub site as well, which Matt shared. So yeah, we'll we'll have a look at this. This is this is interesting. Um I don't know any other questions for Carlos. All right, there was one question uh, from uh, Eve uh, from the Proteary group. Uh, he says, uh, are these new versions already deployed in Galaxy EU? And the answer is yes, but I, you know, uh, I don't know uh, how many people have started using those uh, in their workflows. Uh, yeah, I think uh, they were deployed in the European use Galaxy, but not sure about the last uh, versions. Uh, last uh, news I had is that uh, Beyond uh, deployed the uh, first uh, versions of both new backend branches, but maybe not the last ones with the uh, latest bug fixes and improvements. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Robin Sievers, I saw your message. I will follow up with you about the metaproteomics workflows that we have. Um, Thanks for joining. I know. Uh, any other questions uh, for the speakers? 
All right. Uh, we will be meet, meeting next time on May 20th, uh, not May 13th, and I'll send an email about it. And we haven't yet decided topics. I mean, one of the topics is decided. I think uh, Melanie uh, and, and the Schilling group basically will be talking about max quant and uh, MS stats. So that will be the tool part of it. Uh, Melanie, do you want to give a preview on that? So I'm not sure actually if it makes sense because the same talk will probably come up during GCC. So I was wondering if we should use this meeting before the GCC more for some discussions or uh, mm -hmm. I don't know, going sure. through the GTN material, um, something that's not related to talks that come back uh, one or two months later. Sounds good. We can we can decide on the agenda, but uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I like this fact that if you have one user and one tool, uh, like you know, a tool developer and then one uh, kind of a end user perspective. But you know, for the next meeting, we could just have some kind of a discussion on how do we you know continue with this. And um, you know, the idea is to basically involve more people, uh, especially end users as well as new tools that I developed and GTN material. So um, yeah, we can we can follow up with that. But we are be, we'll be meeting on May 20th. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank uh, Matt and Carlos uh, for their talks. Thank you very much um, for the talks. Uh, we will definitely follow up with you on some of the, I mean, there's, there's a lot of material Matt provided and a lot of, uh, you know, information Carlos also provided. So we'll definitely follow up with you and see if there are any opportunities to see that, you know, uh, your research is supported and secondly if your tools are tested and optimized so thanks everybody and uh, have a good april 1st or april 2nd in some of your cases so uh, thanks a lot guys bye so bye bye bye, -bye. thank you